Thanks for being here today, and I'm just going to share with you uh, the surgical management of uh, colon and rectal cancer. So just to give a brief overview, I'll give you some background information, um, how patients present, how we work them up, and how we treat it. Um, <clears throat> so just to take a step back, um, the large intestine as we know it is comprised of the colon and rectum. Um, it's approximately five feet in length. Uh, the, its job is to basically resorb water uh, and store waste, and then our rectum actually accommodates this waste and is a very smart organ and lets us know when we need to go to the bathroom and helps us uh, eliminate that waste. Um, so our muscles around the end of the rectum or the anus, which is the sphincter complex, controls our continence. So if you were to ask me which organ is the smarter one, it's definitely the rectum versus the colon. Um, it starts on the right side where the small intestine empties into the cecum, and then you have your ascending colon on the right side, the transverse colon in the middle, uh, which then moves down to the descending colon, the sigmoid colon, uh, then down onto the rectum and the anus. So um, if you see here, uh, colon and rectal cancer is actually the third leading uh, cancer types, um, an estimated new cancer deaths um, in the U.S. as of 2009. Um, and so some statistics just to kind of impress upon you, um, it's the number two leading cause of deaths among men and women in the U.S. combined. Um, it accounts for nearly 10% of cancer deaths in the U.S. Um, one in three adults aged 50 to 75 are not up to date with their recommending colorectal cancer screening. Um, the median age of diagnosis is 69 years old. One in 20 or around 5% of men and women will be diagnosed with colorectal cancer in their lifetime. African Americans are more likely to develop colorectal cancer, and screening rates are lower than average in this group, uh, so they're more likely to be diagnosed after the cancer is spread. Um, and just to kind of go along with that, um, there's a data that shows that while new colorectal cancers um, in older adults age 50 and over have fallen consistently since 19, 1985, um, the rates of colorectal cancer for people under age 50 have risen. Um, and this is particularly uh, the case for rectal cancers. After 2001, there was an average annual increase of 2.1% in, yo in uh, young onset of colorectal cancer compared to the decrease of 2.5% yearly for those age 50 and older. Um, rectal cancer cases increased even more rapidly in younger patients at an average annual change of 3.9%. So based on current research, the median age of younger patients is 44 with three out of four or 75.2% diagnosed in their 40s. Um, another study found that most patients diagnosed with colorectal cancer under age 50 experience signs and symptoms such as um, um, bleeding, pain, um, change in their bowel habits, and they have left or rectal cancers, um, which are diagnosed in, in more advanced diseases. So risk factors, we already talked a little bit about the background, and Dr. Pachapin did a really nice thorough job, so I'm gonna sort of gloss over this, but. Um, um, getting on to uh, signs and symptoms or what, how patients present. Um, patients may have blood in their stool, change in bowel habits with new constipation or diarrhea, unexpected or unexplained weight loss, abdominal, pelvic, or rectal pain, anemia, fatigue. Um, and so when we manage colorectal cancer, uh, it's really a multidisciplinary team approach. So um, it's a combination of both the gastroenterologists and the colorectal surgeons, along with our onco medical oncologists and radiation oncologists, our radiologists and our pathologists, along with all the support services in order to provide a multidisciplinary uh, care approach um, for our patients. And this is how we do everything here at NYU. Um, we have a really great team approach uh, to colorectal cancer care. So how is the cancer diagnosed? Um, usually it's diagnosed on a colonoscopy or what's called a virtual colonoscopy, which is a CAT scan test. Um, and usually the gastroenterologists are the ones who are making the diagnosis. Um, and then as a group, we will make sure that the cancer is staged. So what does that mean? That means figuring out how advanced it is. So we do that by usually a CAT scan. Um, we'll get a CAT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. Um, and then if somebody has a rectal cancer, 
um, the treatment will change based on the stage. And so we do what's called a local staging, meaning figuring out how advanced the tumor is in the rectum based on either an MRI of the pelvis or an endorectal ultrasound, which is a special ultrasound. And what that lets us see is how deep the tumor invades, which is called the T stage, and whether or not there's lymph nodes involved, which is the N stage. Based on that is how we determine our treatment plan. So how do we treat it? So like I said, it's based on stage. Um, and so if we detect it at an early stage, we have a higher chance of uh, treating it successfully and curing it. Um, metastatic disease means that the cancer is spread to other organs. Um, with colorectal cancer, the liver and the lungs are usually the most likely first places that it could spread. However, it can go to other sites as well. Um, based on the location, whether the tumor is in the colon or the rectum, um, will determine the treatment plan. Um, and we may need more than one um, treatment modality used, which is why it's really important that we approach it as a team with our medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and gastroenterologists, and all the other services that we discussed. Um, so how is colorectal cancer treated? Um, surgery is generally the mainstay of treatment for early stage disease. Um, that means if it's confined to the colon or rectum and hasn't spread. Um, however, if the disease is more advanced and spread outside of the colon or rectum, meaning there's possible metastatic disease, um, then chemotherapy is usually the mainstay of treatment to start. Um, and then for more advanced rectal cancers, meaning that they're invading more deeply or there's lymph nodes involved, um, many times uh, the first part of treatment of rectal cancer that's locally advanced is to give chemotherapy and radiation first, then followed by a surgery. So the key issues that we face as surgeons are, what are our goals of the operation? Well, the goal is to cure the cancer, right? So which operation do we need to do? Um, will it require a colostomy or a bag, which is what's feared by most patients? Um, how are we going to do this? Are we going to do a traditional open approach or minimally invasive surgery? What are the risks of the surgery? It's really important to discuss that with our patients. Um, what's the recovery like and what are the long-term outcomes of the surgery? And are there going to be any additional treatments needed? So the goals of our surgery are to remove all the disease or cure the cancer, meaning we're removing the primary tumor, making sure we have a good distance around the tumor in case there's microscopic spread, and removing the lymph nodes along with it. Um, Another goal is to relieve the symptoms. So often patients have symptoms of bleeding, obstruction, or pain. So by removing the cancer surgically, we can also um, relieve the symptoms. And then we also want to preserve the quality of life of our patients. So which operation are we going to do? Well, for the colon, usually we do what's called a partial or a segmental colectomy, meaning removing a piece of the colon and putting it back together. And in the rectal cancers, it gets a little bit more challenging because we always try to preserve the sphincter, meaning not remove that sphincter muscle so that the patient can then use the bathroom normally after surgery versus needing a bag. Um, however, if the tumor is quite low, um, we may need to do what's called an APR or an abdominal perineal resection, um, which involves a permanent colostomy. So here's just an example um, for colon cancers. Um, so this is tumors confined to the colon itself. If a tumor is in the cecum or the right side, we would do a right hemicolectomy, meaning removing the right side of the colon here. If the tumor is on the left side, we may do a left hemicolectomy or removing the left side or a sigmoid resection, just to show you again. Um, if it's in between, then we need to use our judgment based on the location <clears throat> um, as to what needs to be removed. And then as far as rectal cancer goes, it will depend if it's in the upper part of the rectum, the middle part of the rectum, or the lower part of the rectum. If it's in the upper part of the rectum, we do what's called a low anterior resection and put the uh, colon back down to the remaining part of the rectum. If it's in the middle of the rectum, we would also do what's called a low anterior resection uh, and put the rectum back together. But oftentimes in these patients, um, if the tumor is advanced, they'll have what's called neoadjuvant or preoperative chemotherapy and radiation. And after putting those um, 
those patients uh, back together at the time of surgery, they may require what's called a loop ileostomy or a temporary bag in order to allow everything to heal after the radiation and the surgery. If the tumor is quite low, like I mentioned before, and it's an early stage cancer, then sometimes we can remove it what's called transanally, meaning going through the anus and just removing the tumor if it's very, very superficial and shallow. However, if it is quite advanced and it is sitting right next to the anal sphincter or the muscle that we control our bowels with, then sometimes a patient might, that's when a patient might need an abdominal perineal resection or, or a permanent bag. We always try our best to avoid this, and we actually have some new surgical techniques which are available where we can actually go quite low and do things like what's called a transanal TME or an intersphincteric dissection using our laparoscopic or minimally invasive surgery and avoid permanent bags. So we actually have more tools now in our armamentarium to try to avoid these permanent situations for patients and not have to have them have a permanent bag. So, like I just mentioned, um, the uh, uh, idea of a colostomy or ileostomy or a bag um, is generally not needed for colon surgery, and we talk about them more commonly with rectal cancers. Um, oftentimes, it's just a temporary situation while we let everything heal up for about six to eight weeks. Um, however, if the tumor is very low, like I mentioned, even though we have new technology, sometimes um, that's when it would be necessary. So um, the, the approach we use for surgery is based on patient characteristics, their previous surgical history, and the tumor location. Um, we used to do traditional or what's called open surgery, and nowadays most of us are doing what's called minimally invasive surgery. This uses a combination of a camera, a small incision, and small instruments, and it can be approached either laparoscopic, meaning traditional uh, minimally invasive surgery, or now robotic, meaning using the robot, like you see here in the picture, um, to approach it. And essentially what we do is make very small incisions, about five millimeter incisions to 10 millimeter incisions, so a dime or a, a nickel size incision, um, where we insert a camera, we blow up the belly with gas. Um, that allows us to do all the work we need to do inside, and then uh, remove the piece of the colon with the cancer, put it back together, and then sometimes we have to make it just a small incision to be able to remove that piece of colon with the tumor in it. So here you see surgeons at work um, using the camera and the small incisions. This is called laparoscopy, um, where they are working in the abdomen and looking at a video screen with the image projected on the screen to be able to do the work that they need to do. And they basically can do everything on the inside and then remove the piece of colon through a small incision. So this is what it looks like on the, on the screen, where you see the, the colon here with the, the fatty tissue or mesentery around it that needs to be removed. And this is what robotics looks like in the operating room. So robotics is a team approach where we have the surgeon um, basically sits at a console um, and looks into a monitor. And then there's another surgeon at the table helping with the instruments um, and swapping out what's necessary. And the, um, the surgeon operator is able to perform everything they need to by using small incisions and a camera the same way, but the robotic arms the, the um, benefit of it is that the arms can actually swivel um, with 270 degree motion. So it's a wristed instrument. So basically we can do a lot more and have a lot more flexibility, um, get into tight spaces um, and do a lot more work um, instead of having a two-dimensional view like you saw in laparoscopy, the robot is, has a 3D HD view. So we can see everything better, we can do much finer movements and be much more precise. Um, the benefit of both laparoscopic and robotic surgery um, is that they're smaller incisions, so it's more cosmetic. There's uh, been proven to be less postoperative pain, a shorter hospital stay with a faster recovery to return to your life or your work. Um, and we've shown that the rates of cancer cure or recurrence are no different in using these modalities versus the traditional open surgery. So you got all these benefits um, with uh, no change in your um, cure rates um, or recurrence of cancer. So um, what are the downfalls of surgery or what are the risks of surgery? So there could be 
complications like cardiac or pulmonary risks. There could be infections. There could be bleeding. Um, someone, someone might need a blood transfusion. And then the thing that we worry about as surgeons, in addition to that, is what's called an anastomotic leak, which means when we take, it's like plumbing. I tell patients like plumbing, we take out a piece of the pipe and we put it back together. But if that area where we put back together doesn't seal well, um, the risk is that the stuff from the inside can leak outside, and that's what's called an anastomotic leak, and that can make a patient very sick. Um, it's very uncommon that that happens. Um, however, it is um, a serious uh, potential complication or postoperative risk of surgery. So what do we tell patients to expect? So Normally, if the patient's not admitted for an emergency surgery, uh, we schedule the surgery as an outpatient. Um, we counsel the patient ahead of time and go through everything about what they're going to encounter when they get to the hospital. Um, they take a bowel preparation the night before surgery. They come to the hospital the day of surgery and then um, generally spend about three days average in the hospital and about two to six weeks at home. Um, this obviously will change depending on the approach used. So if it's a minimally invasive approach, the patients are getting up, walking around that night after surgery. Um, we allow patients to eat the day of surgery and the next morning they can, um, you know, we start with liquids and then advance to regular food. Um, Long term wise, the bowel function is largely unchanged. So removing a piece of that colon doesn't affect the rest of your colon and your colon's job is to absorb water. So by removing one piece, the rest of the colon over time just adapts to, to removing the, the water that that piece that's missing removed. So you may have some change in your bowel habits initially in the first couple of days, but after that, everything generally works itself out to, to be um, largely unchanged. Um, the difference in uh, rectal surgery for rectal cancer is that we do surgery in the pelvis and there's important nerves that go to the bladder and the sexual organs and these could be affected. So that's a potential side effect um, when we do rectal cancer surgery. So I just want to leave you with some good news because I know I gave some pretty daunting news when we, when we first started. So um, in March 2014, the American Cancer Society data was revealed um, that the incidence in colon cancer rates have dropped 30% in the U.S. in the last 10 years among adults age 50 and older. So I think that's really great, and this is due to the widespread uptake of colonoscopy as a screening test. Um, the largest decrease was occurring in those patients age 65 and up. In January of 2013, the American Cancer Society reported a 30% decrease in the mortality rate for colon cancer, which is great. Um, and we've had a decline in the lives lost to cancer between 1991 and 2009. We've also seen a 30% decrease in the mortality rate for colorectal cancer. Um, the likelihood of dying from colorectal cancer has been decreasing due to our increasing rates of screening. So obviously this points to the importance of screening. And so there's more than 1 million survivors of colorectal cancer in the United States, and I feel privileged to speak before you guys today because I know that there are some survivors in our audience here. Over 60% of deaths from colorectal cancer could be avoided with screening. So again, the importance of screening. And the CDC, um, so, so the country has sort of responded uh, to this need um, and created these programs. The CDC has created the Colorectal Cancer Control Program, or the CRCCP, which has provided the necessary funds to establish colorectal cancer programs in 25 states and four tribes across the United States. And then the Screen for Life National Colorectal Cancer Action Campaign, um, which was launched in 1999, encourages men and women aged 50 years and older to be screened regularly for colorectal cancer. So in summary, oops, sorry, um, this is a common disease which is preventable and curable. Um, we have a multimodality multi team approach, um, which is important for our best outcomes. And it's important to seek out experienced teams in high volume centers um, for the best results and to ensure that your care is provided in a way where you have a multimodal team approach uh, to colorectal cancer. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>